The relation of truth to time might seem simple enough if stated in general terms. Make a complete report of all events occurring in time, and there you have the truth. But a complete report, though suggested and even in one sense pursued in all truth-telling, remains always a pure ideal. Be it in the witness box or be it in the laboratory, that whole truth which we are pledged to tell can never be told. It would take too long much longer than the events have taken to happen, and our means of observation are limited, as well as our means of expression. Moreover, when we enlarge the canvas and consider the total truth of the universe, we perceive that the impossibility of actually knowing it is intrinsic. In order that even a superhuman survey of history should be complete, the last of future events would have had to occur and to show its color. Therefore, an actual survey, which would be a fresh event, could not supervene. Or if it supervened, it could not be all-inclusive, since by arising, this survey itself would have added an important event to history. The truth, then, forms an ideal realm of being impersonal and super-existential. Though everything in the panorama of history be temporal, the panorama itself is dateless. For evidently the sum and system of events cannot be one of them. It cannot occur after anything else or before anything else. Thus, the truth about existence differs altogether in ontological quality from existence itself. Life and motion are gone. All scales are equally real. All ages equally present. Intensity, actuality, suffering have become historical. The truth is like the moon, beautiful but dead. On the other hand, the truth is much richer than existence can be at any moment. Not only does it retain the essence of all moments equally, but it contains much that each moment, and even all moments in their inner being, can never contain, since it contains also the systems which these moments form unawares, merely by coexisting and alternating as they do. Truth might be figuratively called the memory of the universe, but it is far more than that, since the destiny of the universe is included in the truth. If we fancifully give the name of memory to the past of the world, we must imagine that memory to be complete and unmixed with error, else it would not contain but contradict the truth of the past, whilst in regard to the future, the truth would still loom before advancing events with a tragic ambiguity. Like an oracle heard and known to be infallible, but as yet impossible to decipher. Thus, though the truth is created by contingent events and secondary to them, and though destiny is but the confluence of successive spontaneity, truth nevertheless confronts existence with a divine authority and an insoluble problem of self-knowledge. Nor is it congruous with the nature of life that the truth should be completely revealed to it. Glimpses come only in tragic moments or to strangely disinterested minds, and the revelation is dangerous, even when it seems entrancing. The world at one moment, like Narcissus, may fall in love with its own image, seen in the truth, but at another moment that image may become a gorgon and may petrify the eye that beholds it. The truth would not be complete if it left unrecorded that asymmetrical lapse and precipitation of motion in which it cannot participate. Change translated into terms of truth, becomes the genealogy and measure of change. Events become the subject matter of science and history. 
constitutional incapacity to change is not a defect on the part of the church, but on the contrary a proof of its staunchness and its privilege of permeating existence without forfeiting its own ideality. One event cannot be the truth of another. While each fact undergoes change by yielding up its place and substance to new facts, the truth of that occurrence can be only the form of the successive facts with the form of the transition between them. We should doubtless have no notion of change if we do not undergo it, yet it is not by merely passing that facts free memory or an intuition of time stretching forward and back. It is the enrichment, the complexity, the multiform tensions of organic life as it flows that enable us to feel life flowing. Intellectual synthesis does not require any existential element to be in two moments at once, but material energies, rich in vital potentiality, can become conscious of changes on foot. This actually happens when a psyche organized for growth and sensitive to opportunity, being adjusted both to the past and to the future, feels at each moment the suspense, duration, and lapse of time. The canvas is then spread for imagination to paint upon, and history and science do nothing but fill it in. At each moment we are then accompanied by a sense of prolonged events in their wholeness. That is to say, as they lie in the realm of truth. For it is only in the realm of truth that events can be unified or divided. The very concentration of existence in the moving present prevents any contrasts, repetitions, or derivations from actually disrupting that momentary reality. Yet this reality, by continually pulsing and changing, renders such contrasts repetitions, and derivations true. It is precisely this continuity of events and these truths about them that intelligence comes to perceive, not imagining and positing those truths falsely, as the enemies of intelligence would like to suggest, but imagining and positing them truly, because if there were no substantial derivation of event from event, and if generation were not bridged by the truth of generation, no proposition could have an existing object, and all signs and beliefs would be equally vain. For example, there could then be no identity between the child of A and the father of C, since B would be contiguous with each only under a different aspect, nor could the B who had A for his father be identical with the B whom A had for his son. In other words, each flash of change would be a separate universe, and events would therefore have no dates and compose no history. Such a disruption of nature, or chaos of particulars, is not logically impossible. It might be the truth, but in that case all sensation and thought would terminate upon mere essence, and the idea of a flux of experience would be a false idea since between actual moments there would be no transition, and time would be unrolled into a firmament of simultaneous facts. If chronology can be a true science, memory and dramatic imagination must be organs of truth, they must be truly inspired. The prophets of mutation, who say that all is change, are, against their will, shining instances of intelligence. Far from sinking with every wave, they keep their heads always above water, proclaiming how perpetually and pervasively the ocean flows. It might seem, for instance, that the truth changes as fast as the facts which it describes. On a day before the Ides of March, it was true that Julius Caesar was alive. On the day after that Ides of March, it had become true that he was dead. A mind that would keep up with the truth must therefore be as nimble as the flux of existence. It must be a newspaper mind. This, on the surface, is an innocent sophism, if not a bit of satire, mocking the inconstancy of things. Idiomatically, 
you might as properly say, it was then true that Caesar was living, as you might say, the truth is that Caesar was then living. In using the former phrase, we have no thought of denying the latter. If Julius Caesar was alive at a certain date, it was then true, it had been true before, and it will be true always that at that date he was, or would be, or had been alive. These three assertions, in their deliverance, are identical, and in order to be identical in their deliverance, they have to be different in form, because the report is made in each case from a different point in time, so that the temporal perspectives of the same fact, Caesar's death on the Ides of March, require different tenses of the verb. This is a proof of instability in knowledge in contrast to the fixity of truth. For the whispered oracle, beware the eyes of March. The tragic event was future. For the senators crowding round Pompey's statue, it was present. For the historian, it is past. And the truth of these several perspectives, each from its own point of origin, is a part of the eternal truth about that event. Beneath the surface, however, there is no doubt a remnant of metaphysical illusion by which we transfer to physical time the sentimental color of our temporal perspectives. Instead of the physical truth that all men live in their own day and in their own day only, we say, Caesar lived long ago. Or we may, long ago, or we may even cry pathetically, Caesar is dead, long dead. We thus slide from a truism to a private perspective, and from a private perspective to a dramatic equivocation. For that Caesar lived long ago is true only in relation to our own times, and that he is dead, long dead, is not true of him at all, if we mean his life or his consciousness, but at most might be true of his corpse, if that still existed. But words lead us to imagine that things can survive themselves. When Caesar has ceased to live, we have to believe that he continues to exist dead. Nothing exists dead except dead bodies. Facts exist only as they occur, and the essence and truth of them, which are indeed eternal, are non-existent. Names, however, being hereditary, and essences being often exemplified repeatedly or continuously in existence. We tend to attribute the identity proper to the essence or the name of the similar but diffuse moments that inherit that name or that essence. But between moments or facts, however similar to one another, there is no identity. The existence of each is internal and self-centered, and each constitutes a primary contingent factor and each constitutes a primary contingent factor in a world which, as a world and in its detail, is perfectly contingent and unnecessary. There is therefore a metaphysical illusion or idolatry in peopling the world with hypostatic identities and materialized truths, the curious consequence being that truth and essence themselves come to be obscured by confusion with the flux of facts. Two words in particular are apt to suffer this hypostatus when truth is spoken of as changing. The word now and the word I. I could once say truly, I am now young. At present I can say truly, I am now old. Therefore it would seem that the truth about me is changed. But it was never true that I am now young. If now means the year 1936, the now or 50 years earlier, though it had the same essence of actuality and was being lived through as breathlessly as the now of today, was an entirely different moment. I know that concrete moment could never become true for me to say, now I am old. The essence of nowness runs like fire along the fuse of time, but the particular spark is different at each point. The various contents of these various nows therefore combine perfectly to form the unchangeable truth of history. 
Even deeper is the metaphysical illusion in hypostatizing the word I. Much used to be much used to be written concerning personal identity and responsibility. The soul and future had the soul and future had somehow to deserve damnation for its past sins, as for those of Adam. This moral enigma seems to have ceased from troubling, as if people were content to blame each moment for its own folly, but the cognitive problem of memory still perplexes philosophers. Each man uses the word I to designate his physical person at all ages, awake or asleep, and the continuity of his body, bearing always the same name, leads him to think of himself as a self-identical being entering into relation with changing things. Yet his body, not to speak of his thoughts, notoriously changes faster than many a tree or river, whilst that in him which bridges time, pictured time only, is not a substantial fact at all but an intellectual faculty called intuition, and the occasions on which this faculty is exercised are themselves movements of the psyche. As transitory and irrecoverable, as any other events in nature. He may indeed give to all instances of intuition or feeling the common name of spirit, and may say that this spirit is identical at all moments and even in all persons. But such identity is qualitative only. Spirit in all those instances has the same transcendental status and infinite potential scope. It is everywhere intelligence and act. But this pure spirit or gift of consciousness flashes out only on scattered occasions. It is nothing substantial or permanent or continuous, capable by its prolonged existence of being present at once at every point of time. It is nothing substantial or permanent or continuous, capable by its prolonged existence of being present at once at every point of time. Such persistence is found only in objects on the human scale that may be handed down like heirlooms and still be conventionally identical. Yet accurate physics dissolves even that prolonged identity into something formal and imputed, while in extending that analogy to spirit, language goes wholly astray. Spirit being the flower of life is intrinsically fresh and self-positing at every moment. There is nothing identical in these moments except their spiritual essence. This essence, the word I, may indicate by its purely grammatical and generic force, is intrinsically fresh and self-positing at every moment. There is nothing identical in these moments except their spiritual essence. This essence, the word I, may indicate by its purely grammatical and generic force, when it stands only for the transcendental function of thinking, identical in all thoughts. But these thoughts were instances of thinking, far from being thereby materialized into a continuous fact, become each a transcendental center for an ideal survey of time. They are lodged in physical time only by virtue of their organs. They are intrinsically dateless, as any synthesis of time must be in respect to the events it surveys. Thus language may lead us to attribute to facts the timelessness of essences, and to create contradictions in knowledge where there is merely instability in existence. It is only when we ignore our own mutation that the truth seems to us to change.